Good morning! I'm Chris Nortcliffe of the Baron Group and I'm here to show you um, some processes involved in nano electroporate ionisation for analysis of proteins and small molecules. Uh, we're going to start today by going through the procedure of pulling a borosilicate glass tip for nano ESI and I'm going to show you how to um, fill it with a sample and place it inside a Synapt G2 ion bulletin instrumentation and then how to get spray and signal and how to analyse that system. I'm going to start by saying we're using nano ESI compared to ESI and the difference, the, the difference between those two processes. Um, both of them work on the very same principle um, if you apply a voltage to a capillary and um, it's offset by a cone in the source. But applying some backing pressure you get a tailor cone of ions, uh, droplets are formed and as the droplet evaporates charge is left behind because that is leaving ions. If you nano spray in ESI um, ESI uses larger flow volumes that give larger droplets. Um, nano ESI uses much lower volumes, down to 10 microliters, and we get smaller droplet sizes in a smaller orifice. The smaller droplets uh, mean that it's a softer process, you get more gentle uh, ionization, and with less sample, you tend to preserve more non covalent complexes into the gas phase. We'll start off by showing you how to pull a borosilicate glass tip. We're going to be using uh, the Sutter instrumentation, which is the common tip pulling source. Um, here we have both the filament and laser models, and we'll be showing you how to do it on the filament system. The borosilicate glass tip comes intact like this, and we're going to pull it into two separate tips. This is the instrumentation we use, and we'll end up with a pulled glass tip like this. So, starters, you place your intact glass tip on the side here, and push it forward until you can hold it with your thumb, and then tighten this clamp. Releasing the catch, you push it forward until it's all the way across and repeat on the far side. I can now loosen this clamp and slide the tip across here until it's even on both sides and then I will tighten it. Now there are several settings um, on the tip puller we can use. Um, if I put in a setting involving heat, pull, velocity and time. These settings will be different for each filament. Therefore, the settings I have here will be different on your instrument, and you can learn your samples through trial and error. When we're ready to pull, make sure both are tightened, and press the pull button. Now the filament, the filament heats up, um, and the two sides will be pulled apart at known uh, strength and velocity, to the point where the uh, joining part becomes thin and breaks, giving two pulled glass tips. You now take these from the instrument and they're ready to use. It's important to check your tips under a microscope to make sure they've pulled properly. Some tip settings leave diffused tips or broken tips. When a tip, setting, a tip is pulled, the end becomes very fragile. I'm now going to show you the difference between an uh, intact tip and a broken tip under the microscope. So here we can see an example um, of two pulled tips. The one on your right has been pulled nicely. See how it's evenly symmetrical, goes to a nice sharp point uh, with a small orifice. The one on the left has been broken. This can be done easily as catching it against a piece of cloth or a surface, or sometimes in, when they're pulled in a wrong fashion. The tip on the right will spray nicely in the instrument, the tip on the left will not. It's important to check your tip when they've pulled to make sure A, your settings are correct, your tips are pulling nicely, and B, you haven't caught your tips on anything uh, to cause breakages. Now we've pulled our borosilicate glass tips, I'm going to show you how to introduce sample into them ready for the instrument. I'm going to show you two methods. Uh, the first method is using the Hamilton syringe, the other method is using the uh, gel loading tips. Uh, both have their advantages. Uh, the Hamilton syringe uh, works out cheaper over time. With samples, it's easy and it's hard to get wrong. Um, the gel tip, um, especially if you've got uh, very small volumes, very precious samples, occasionally the Hamilton doesn't pull up all your volume, um, whereas the uh, gel tip is really good for picking everything. Also, occasionally when the Hamilton has got very sensitive samples, you can get some carryover, they can wash it out. The gel tip, because it's disposable, means that you don't have any carryover ever. To fill the syringe tip, quite simply place it in your sample and suck up slowly. Up to about 10 microliters. Take your pole glass tip, be careful not to touch the end. Slowly place the needle inside the bottom of the capillary and push the plunger slowly. As the sample starts to appear, pull back your capillary so you're only filling the very edge. This helps prevent air bubbles. This leaves you with a filled tip. 
The other method is to use the gel loading tip. Here, set your syringe between uh, 10 and 12 microliters. Press the plunger and suck up the fluid. Wait a few seconds as the fluid action takes a while. And then, as before, take your pull tip, place the end of the pillory uh, with the needle, and press the plunger slowly. And again, we see liquid start to appear. Pull back. See only filling the end. Now, as I mentioned earlier, a problem you can get with these methods uh, is the appearance of air bubbles. Um, air bubbles cause a problem um, as when you apply voltage to the capillary. Uh, the air bubble separates it so it can't reach the end of the tip where spray is happening and therefore you lose spray. Um, there are three methods we can get air bubbles out of the tip. The first off um, is the tap. Hold your capillary and tap it gently with your finger. This releases air bubbles from the sides and they come to the surface. This will handle most air bubbles. The second method is the sharp downward flick. Be careful you do the lab picture no one's around you that can be dangerous, but flick it sharply downwards. If these methods haven't removed your air bubbles, you can centrifuge your tips using a centrifuge lock like this, placing your tip along and clamping it. Uh, this method is very effective, however occasionally you lose some sample. It's not recommended for very small sample volumes, although it will remove just about every air bubble. When your sample is filled in a tip and uh, air bubbles are free, you are to take the instrument uh, and put it inside and get some signal. So, now we've filled our borosilicate glass tip, we're ready to place it inside the instrument and attain signal. Um, when you have your glass tip, we're going to place it what we call the carousel. Take care not to catch the end of the tip on anything around here, because that will break um, and you'll need to uh, get it, uh, make a new tip. Um, also take care not to put bubbles in this procedure, um, as this is one stage that can actually put them in. You want in the carousel just a bit less than a centimetre sticking out the far side, and then you'll put your platinum wire in the bottom. Now, our group used platinum wire. Um, in our narrow aspirate tips. Some other groups like to gold coat their tips. Both methods are effective. The gold coating we find, however, because the geometry of the tip in the end, and it can easily get broken, we find a lot of times if you gold coat them, you might gold coat a tip, come to the instrument and find out it's broken and won't work. And therefore, by putting the platinum wire in, they're reusable, it's a much quicker process. It doesn't give it any much production signal, and therefore you can get a better turnover. When you've got the tip inside, and make sure there's a connection at the end, and put inside the metal source block. And you want to screw it up finger tight. Then place this in on the instrument. Now this instrument is a Synap G2. Depending on your instrumentation, this may have a pull-out sideways source, or broken housing systems have a different orientation entirely. Um, this is uh, it's to do what we need to do on your system. I point out a key features that are common throughout. So opening the source system. Here we can see our tip in space, and this will sit around here where it's all closed up. Here we have the external cone, and we have what's called a Z spray source. The sample will sit here, and the idea is any non ionized particle in the tail of the cone should carry straight onto here. Only ionized particles should head this way. However, because of the vacuum, some non ionized particles will head this way, and therefore the second Z spray going this way. Uh, this means that only non ionized particles should enter the instrument. The advantage of this is if you've got less nice particles going in, it should easily do cleaning and then put a big system where it's really get better signal the noise. The cone can also be removed against different for all simple systems. It should be cleaned about after every day, uh, depending on how salty or poor your samples are. When the instrument's all ready to go, close the source up, and we're now ready to acquire signal. Now we have our sample introduced in the instrument, uh, the, the tip it in place. We can now start acquiring some signal. I'm going to point out a few features of the software. Again, it's different depending on what instrument you have, but there's certain key features that will be true throughout. The first is the capillary voltage. This is the voltage you are applying to the tip. Um, for nanolight spray, you want to be between 1 and 1.8, um, the highest of 2 kilovolts, although you want to keep this as low as possible. If you're doing ESR, you can go higher between 2.5 and 3. If you're doing LC flow rates, you probably want a highest uh, capillary to ensure you get spray throughout. 
Next setting is a sampling cone or cone. This is how strongly irons are pulled into the source. A low cone setting uh, will keep in intact uh, non-covalent complexes. A higher cone setting will knock off salt, uh, which is very important for doing larger systems. In general, try and keep it as low as possible uh, to keep your samples in the most native fashion. The extraction cone is an, an, another internal cone which not all instruments have. Source temperature, here we have it at 8 degrees, which is the standard we run at. Um, if you're doing an LC or high flow, you might go to 120. If you're doing non-covalent complex, you might be going to go down as far as 40 or even 20. To start acquiring signal, we're going to put a voltage on the capillary up to about 1.4 volts. And here you can see the signal starting to appear. Uh, this system is a small molecule that forms aggregates, and here we can see a tetramer of four molecules, and here we can see an optimer of eight molecules. We can see how well the sample is spraying by looking here, what we call the shot to shot, which is how intense the strongest iron peak is. So here it's about 2.3 to 2.5. We can then alter the settings to try and get the best signal possible. First off by going up in voltage. No great change in the signal. And again by going down in voltage. Some samples prefer higher voltage and some prefer low voltage. But in general, try to keep voltage as low as possible. By increasing the cone, we'll probably see the fragmentation of this ATMA. So as I go up in cone energy, we'll see a decrease in this intensity. And overall, um, increasing this peak but lowering our methyl spectrum. As we go lower, we see the 8 mer coming in much, much more strongly, and we start to see some 6 mer appear here. Again, as we look at a non covalent system, um, and it isn't particularly salty, we want a nice low voltage, and we can also do the same with the extraction cone, although it has lesser effect. The temperature we're going to leave as it is, we can also alter some uh, voltage in the side instrument. So we can alter the energy in the collision cell, um, some, some uh, systems like the more energy transfer. And then putting more uh, 8 uh, electron volts in the collision cell, we get slightly better transmission. And we could also alter the gas in the source from 50 uh, down to 10, no great change. Now our sample is spraying well enough, um, I'm going to show you how to do some simple experiments uh, that you might do in your instrumentation. Start off with acquiring data. For the, these water instruments, there's usually a button that says acquire somewhere near the top. And we're going to name our sample um, using initials and the date and then either a number or a letter this helps for finding your data later on and we can label what our sample is in the text box and start acquiring whereas here we have what we call a signal on the point detector we're now going to be acquiring on the TOF and we can see this on the chromatogram and the spectrum the chromatogram is showing what we call the total ion count which is the ion count of every ion hitting the detector and the spectrum is what's acquiring every second on the TOF we can add together several scans uh, to get a better signal to noise ratio um, to bring out low intensity signals. We can do this by right clicking on the chromatogram and dragging across. You can now see a spectrum down here and by zooming on the peaks with left click we can see the isotope abundance ratio of uh, this former and we can see from the separation here that we're dealing with a, a 1 plus charge date. We can also zoom in here on the ATMA and I'll see sodiated peaks um, of your sample. Uh, proteins and small molecules like to um, adduct sodium quite easily. Uh, it's very important in your sample preparation to remove all sources of sodium, but there'll always be some around and it's commonly found in a mass spec. You can also see where each ion has appeared in the chromatogram by zooming on the peak with left click and dragging across with the right click of your peak of interest. This is very important in the LC experiments and you can see where each peak in your mass spec has come in the LC run. When you've acquired some data, you can stop the acquisition. Let me show you how to do a simple isolation and fragmentation experiment. So on this Synapse G2 instrumentation, we're going to do TOF MSMS. MS. We're going to isolate the 8 mer peak. I'm going to label the spectra as isolation the 1351 peak. Now we'll see in the spectrum, just simply this peak has come through. And there's some fragmentation down to lower species already, as this species is quite fragile. If we let this acquire for a number of seconds, say at the 30 to 40 mark, I can then start increasing the energy in the trap cell to cause fragmentation down from the 8 mer down to the 4 mer. I've increased the energy here, so the 8 mer drop off and the 4 mer begin to appear um, much stronger. We could sum up over different areas of the spectrum to compare pre-fragmentation with post-fragmentation. Uh, this can be done on proteins to um, 
sequence or identify the localization of additions or modifications. The last experiment I'd like to show you is how to do a simple ionability experiment. On this instrument, this is Setup G2, we use Travelling Wave ionability. Uh, if you have the new Agile instrument, um, you'll be using Drift Tube ionability. Ionability is useful uh, for finding out uh, the size and shape of molecules. Uh, it can be used uh, to determine uh, if modifications such as tags are having structural changes upon your protein. Look at the spectra here. Uh, we see a slight change in the signal as now we have the ionobility cell we're causing some fragmentation and we're no longer seeing the APA species. This is commonly seen as the higher end is involved often break apart fragile species. If you zoom in on the spectra here, we can see the tetramer and by dragging right click across, you can see where the tetramer appears in the overall ionability profile. To require an ionability experiment, as we did before, where ionability, we are now doing IMS, and we're no longer isolating. Travelling wave works by the principle as expect of a wave, with a wave travelling through the ionability cell, with ions of low ability being pushed back by the wave, and ions of high ability travelling over the wave um, and arriving quicker at the detector. Uh, drift tube ionability works a different principle, um, whereas ions are injected into a cell of uh, inert gas, and depending on the number of collisions with gas molecules, uh, it will get slowed down. Uh, therefore, depending on how slow it travels, larger ions will travel slower. Uh, drift tube ionability um, allows direct measurement of cross sections, whereas travelling wave needs to be calibrated to require cross sections from your data. This video has shown you several mass spec based techniques for native mass spec experiments. We have pulled, filled tips, put inside the instrument, and run a few simple experiments. We hope the video has been informative. Thanks for watching!